This program, Words Like Freedom, readers and writers will feature a conversation with Hanif Abdurraqib, author of A Little Devil in America, Notes in Praise of Black Performance, and Donnie Walton, June 19th, 4.30 p.m., available for purchase online from the Schomburg Shop at schomburgshop.com, is the featured book, A Little Devil in America, Notes in Praise of Black Performance. I hope everyone has been having an amazing Juneteenth, and I cannot thank you enough for joining us for our third annual Schomburg Center Literary Festival. If you haven't heard already, my name is Novella Ford, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions at the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture at the New York Public Library. Our theme this year was words like freedom, which takes inspiration from Juneteenth and the opening line from Langston Hughes's poem, Refugee in America, which begins, there are words like freedom, sweet and wonderful to say, on my heartstrings, freedom sings all day, every day. Closing our virtual lit fest is readers and writers, a conversation with Hanif Abdurraqib and Donnie Walton. They will be discussing performance, joy, showing up, and showing out. Hanif is a New York Times bestselling poet, essayist, and cultural critic from Columbus, Ohio. In A Little Devil in America, Notes and Praise of Black Performance, Hanif has written a profound and lasting reflection on how Black performance is inextricably woven into the fabric of American culture. Donnie Walton is a fiction writer and journalist whose work explores identity, place, and the influence of pop culture. Her debut novel, The Final Revival of Opal and Nev, centers a dynamic performance and photo that changes the legacy of an unlikely rock duel that feels truer and more mesmerizing than some true stories, according to New York Times book review. I cannot wait for these two to be in conversation. But before we get started, if you have any questions, please send them anytime using the chat. The library values your privacy, so we want you to know that even though the video and chat are on the Literary Festival website, they are hosted by YouTube. By participating in the chat, you might share data about yourself, which the library does not control. You can order A Little Devil online at the Schomburg Shop at schombergshop.com. The Schomburg Shop supports the work of the Schomburg Center, and you can find this book and all the books featured at the festival today, as well as all of the books that we featured throughout the week. First, we will hear a bit of reading from Hanif, and then Hanif and Donnie will be in conversation. So please welcome Hanif of Jared Rakib. Thank you, Novella, and thanks to the Schomburg Festival for having me. I did not realize today was the last day that this was a closing event. And um, it's just a real joy to, to get to close this out, y'all. I'm going to read a little bit about, the, about Aretha Franklin's funeral um, in very much a little bit, because I just, I'm very excited to talk to Donnie, who I'm a big fan of and who wrote a book I love a lot. It took eight full hours and a band of preachers and their many armed gospels and singers slipping out of their shoes before shaking the church walls down and old friends pacing through old memories and Cicely Tyson's hat casting a wide shadow over her eyes while she read a repurposed poem and showed she could still hold a room in her steady palm. Cicely, our forever godmother, who was helped off the stage by three men so a viewer might do away with the lie of her defying time. It took dancing in the aisles of a church and men hollering affirming cries a go ahead or don't stop now when a speaker caught a good groove it took even the non-preachers becoming preachers anything spilling from a mouth in service of the moment becoming gospel it took all of this but miss aretha franklin finally made it home on a friday evening as i watched the service live in a hotel room in atlanta other viewers spent a full work day and then some glued to their computer monitors or sneaking sips of television glances to see what might come next I fought back tears when NBA player Isaiah Thomas told stories of how Aretha helped raise him into a better man than he was, and I yawned when Clyde Davis lovingly droned on about Aretha and the mechanics of her singing voice, and I cringed during the sprawling 50-minute eulogy by Pastor Jasper Williams Jr. that spanned everything from Black-on-Black -black crime to the ways single mothers were failing to raise their Black sons spoken while Aretha Franklin, a single mother of four boys, rested right before him. But when all the 
the preaching had been preached and almost all the songs had been worn down to echoes and every memory had been rebuilt wide enough for every listener to crawl into, there was Stevie Wonder, Aretha's dear old friend, singing one last tune before she was carried out of the church and onto her final resting place. And in those swelling final moments of Aretha's home going, I thought about what it is to send someone home proper, how even that, when done right, can be a performance on par with a person's living. The Portuguese soccer player Eusebio was given a towering gold casket that was then carried in circles around the Estadio de Luz in Portugal, where he played for years. Michael Jackson's casket was plated with 14 karat gold and lined with velvet for a three-hour ceremony that filled the Staples Center and left the crowd outside waiting. In March 1827, tens of thousands of people marched in the streets of Vienna, bearing torches in the name of Ludwig von Beethoven. The joke many Black people made on the internet as Aretha's service dragged into its fifth and then sixth and then seventh hour was that we all expected this. As some tuned out and tuned back in only to see the ceremony still going on, some scanned the pre-printed funeral agendas to see that nearly every guest speaker and performer had gone well over there a lot of time. There were some who kicked back and said, of course, of course, I suppose we should have all expected a long drawn out affair, although deep down, I think many of us knew that this number of hours was a bit more than even our most extravagant celebrations. But at this point in my life, I have attended far more non-Islamic homegoings than Islamic ones. And so I'm no longer shocked by how time can take away in honor of someone's living, how in the moment, it feels like the least one can do to honor another. But even the most seasoned of my kinfolk knew Aretha's home going was equal parts too much and somehow still not enough, too long and too full of people with too much to say, but still, it kept her with us. Some of the reverends dozed off and some of the church women's heads leaned all the way back in their pews while their mouths hung open in the eighth hour. And some of the people left early and so many of my people clapped their hands together with joy and said, look what we can do. In the late summer, of 2018, an orca whale swam around the Pacific Ocean, carrying the corpse of her dead calf under her fin. The calf had died a few hours after its birth. The orca whale was first spotted attempting to push it toward the edge of the Pacific Ocean between the United States and Canada before deciding to just carry the calf with her, which she did for over two weeks. Observers and scientists called it a tour of grief. The length of mourning was to that point, unprecedented, but it was always a question of letting go. If the whale let her calf go, it would sink to the bottom of the ocean and become a memory. Once, I had a conversation with a poet who also lost their mother. As we charted out our shared grief, that poet told me something they had learned from another poet. Well, we have two mothers, they began to tell me. The one we keep with us in our hearts and the corpse we cannot put down. And so there is the putting down of the metaphorical corpse and then there is the carrying of the physical, but the hesitation to part with both comes from a similar place. A mother who has lost a child carries with her not only the corpse of that child, but the potential for what that life could have been. I mourn both the actual body and the potential for the whole person it held. How much better my time in the world World could have been spent with all the once living people I've loved still here. The drawn out funeral or the pictures on the wall or the remembrances yelled into a night sky are all a part of that carrying, all fighting for the same message, holding on to the memory of someone with two hands and saying, I refuse to let you sink. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Honey, thank you for that uh, reading. I was blown away by this book. I raced through it. I've been nervous all week to talk to you because I just, there are no words. <laughs> that essay in particular, I think captures something that's very special about this book, which is that it feels both expansive and so very intimate. And the way you weave toward experiences that we've witnessed communally Aretha's funeral being too much and still not enough, and also your expressions of, of personal grief. So um, this is a very emotional book for those of us who not only love culture, love Black culture, but um, experience life and things about life. So thank you for being here. Happy Juneteenth. <laughs> <laughs>
Happy doing it, Kane. Thank you for being here. I, I mean, I'd said it before we came on, but I'm such a big fan of your work and um, your interest in archival. No one saw this. So I was like, we should be friends because <laughs> I feel like we have the same kind of proclivities. We do. And we, you know, um, you know, uh, when Novella was on earlier, we were talking about her Josephine Baker poster and Josephine, as well as other figures we have in common in our books between Mary Clayton and, um, you know, I just, there were so many church grunts for me when I was reading this book, you know, um, but I want to start with this cover. So the cover was the first thing that really spoke to me because I know this picture. Yeah. <laughs> I used to work at Life in the photo archives at Life. And oh, no so way. it grabbed me and then in combination with the title. I mean, I just want to talk about how you came to this cover and how you feel this photograph sort of sets the table for what's inside. Yeah, you know, what's wild is, and I, you know, gratitude to Random House. I'm so, I mean, people who know my work and know my journeys and my books have been, I'm so intent about cover stuff. I mean, I, you know, for Go Ahead in the Rain, I did the cover largely myself. Um, or dreamed up the cover large myself. Same for most of, a lot of my other books with the help of designers. But um, this one was so intense because we would land on a cover and I'd be like, that's the one, you know, let's, let's check it off the list. And then I would wake up in the middle of the night and be like, no, there's something better. There's definitely something better. And I would send it frantic emails and editors like, no, no, let's come off that one. I'll find another one. I'll find another one that's better. The cover that was almost the cover, I wish I could send it to people so I could see. It was actually a photo of Josephine Baker um, like jumping in the air with their arms spread out. I, I'd felt I'd had, a, I'd had some, some internal struggles with using a photo with using that photo, but I love it so much. But then I landed on this. Uh, I knew I wanted to find a photo of black folks in the throes of something thrilling that any, if you could see that I wanted to be able to see the thrill on their faces or coming out of some on their bodies and their bodies in some way. Um, and I wanted to see the, a photo of Black people in the midst of something that you can tell they thought was impossible before they did it. You know what I mean? And this photo, at least Lindy Hop, I mean, you know, because you probably saw all of those uh, those photos from 43, but all the Lindy Hop photos are so good, but I really wanted a Lindy Hop area. And the, the, what, the way Willa Mae Ricker's face looks in this photo is so incredible. Where you can tell she's like looking at Leon James and she's like, I can't believe we're doing this. And that's kind of, so much of this book for me the writing of this book um, was a great nod to the brilliant editor, Maya Millett, who I worked with so closely on this and who really shaped this book. So much of this was the process of us collectively or me individually kind of just leaping into the air and hoping that I figured something out while I was up there, you know? Oh, um, I, I didn't really know what I was doing, especially because I threw away half this book and then reformatted it. And all I knew was, I just want to write about Soul Train. You know, I was watching all these Soul Train videos and I was like, I don't want to argue. I don't want to make an argument for anything. I don't want to, I just want to evangelize. I just want to deliver the good news of this performance that I'm witnessing. And so that photo kind of matched the, the energy I went into the kind of reformatting this book with where, you know, I think when we broke down the edits in the second round, I was kind of like, I just have this soul train essay and that's it. And people were like, that's what you take to the air with you, mm. you know, in the spirit. And, and then the rest of the book, the spirit of the rest of the book will catch you. Yeah. So is that how the whole collection started was with thinking about Soul Train, the Soul Train line, the dancing? Not really. I mean, because it, the, the way the collection first started was thinking about appropriation and thinking about minstrelsy and the way that Black art had been appropriated. But then as I started writing the book, I realized that because I, that's the line of inquiry I chose to follow, I almost had to center whiteness in a way that didn't interest me. Mm. You know, it was one of those things where it's like, I don't know if I can talk about the long sorted history of appropriation without being like, here's some things white people did. And that just wasn't as fun to me. And I, when um, I went back into the working on this book was when I had gotten this hard drive. My friend, uh, a friend of mine sent me a hard drive of every Soul Train episode from 1973 like, to 1989. And so I just watched every night. I was just watching and watching and watching and watching Soul Train and taking notes and writing and writing and writing. What came out was the first essay in the book. And then when I contrasted that essay against the rest of the essays in the book, it was kind of like, well, that's what I want. I want to pursue this new thing. 
and the rest is less exciting to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a way, Soul Train unlocked what this book became. Mm. And the essays in this book go everything from Soul Train to Playing Spades, which I'm going to need some tips from you later in our conversation because <laughs> I'm one of those people that you would partner with that doesn't know really know what she's doing. But yeah. also as an introvert, like I get a little bit intimidated to play Spades because people are getting very angry. They do. Unfortunately, I'm the ideal partner for you then, because I think that like I, I take spades paid partners on as like reclamation projects for some reason where it's like, if you don't know how to play, we're just here having a good time. So I don't really, I, yeah. because I'm not a person. Like, I mean, really... that, that is the attitude. <laughs> yeah, not enough people have that attitude. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to, you know, I, we're just here to have a good time. And I think also it's an act of generosity because when I was coming up, if I recall, no one taught me how to play spades, you know? I watched. I sat at a table. Yeah. I was eventually allowed at a table. And I was eventually allowed to watch what happened at that table. And then I was eventually allowed to hold the cards in my hand. And through that holding, I was allowed to fuck up. I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss here, um, but I was allowed to fuck up. And through that fucking up, there was a love and a care. Uh, and so I think extending that the way that my ancestors did I'm making too much of a card game here, surely, which wouldn't be the first time. But um, I, I do think generous spades partnering is an extension of care and love for our folks who are just like inching along in the game. Not everyone learned the game the same way or at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, card playing runs deep in my family. My father and his brother and my Uncle Bill, like they talk across the table, you know, uh -huh. they always team up, like, and I grew up watching that. And it is, it, it, card playing is very much something that is defining my father's side, especially, you know, like we have the crab boil, we're from Florida, do crab boil, eventually some cards are going to come out. So, right, that's good. so like, not, oof, not talking across the table, home, though. You said they're talking across the table. I don't know. We don't, that's not. I keep that that's in the south. My mom was like, that's why I don't play with y'all. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what I was going to say is, you know, there's talk about spades, you talk about blackface, you talk about expressions of fear and grief. Um, and so I'm going to steal a question from Tracy Toms of the Sax Podcast. Shout out mm -hmm. to Tracy. Um, Tracy. She sort of sets the table by asking you, how are you defining black performance in this book? with such a wide range of interests? That's a good question. I think um, I'm one of those people who have begun to feel a lot of shame around the word performance and performativity because I think the internet has indoctrinated me in a way where it's like, well, this person's performing and that's bad. But I also begin to think of the little small performance. I'm not talking about like stage photos or whatever. I'm talking about like these small performances that get me through a day. You know, and Donnie, you know this undoubtedly. Like, you, like we can talk about this because we both our books came out the same day. We've had the same kind of type press cycles. Like, if you hit the third or fourth interview of a day, in your year, as as at least for me, I can't speak for you, I guess. But for me, if I have four interviews in a day, by the time I hit the fourth interview, I'm undoubtedly performing as a mode of survival, right? <laughs> like, just as a mode of getting from one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. And so, I began to want to unravel the many ways I saw my mother perform. My mother who was bipolar, but still entered the world with warmth and generosity. And even though I, I could watch it, it was hard on her and I could see the difficulty that she carried with her. Uh, my father who, who worked a job, he didn't love, but did it well. You know, to think of these type of things as performance, or even to think about spades as a game that relies on a type of performativity allowed me to kind of reclaim that language and repurpose it and press it up against a type of pleasureful existence that I've witnessed, right? When I talk about playing spades with Denez and Gerard in the back of the van, and I talk about each of those players and their personalities, I do that for a reason because what I'm actually setting up is, and look at how they step outside of their personalities in this game. Look at how they kind of use their personalities to become hyper extended versions of themselves 
in the confines of this game. That's a performance and that's a performance I want access to all of the time, right? And so often I think I needed to detach and divorce myself from the idea that black performance existed only to serve the American project and the pleasures of the American project. And in order to do that, I had to say, well, I see my people in a certain way that is inaccessible to the naked eye of the American project. And that's because we know how to perform for only each other, right? Mm. Um, that's maybe a more involved answer than you were looking for, but I've been thinking about that since I finished the book, about how easy it was and how joyful it was for me to write about performance as something that contained multitudes as we all do. And how not only it was important, it was vital to the work. It was, it was vital to me feeling good about myself, my people, and um, I think the fullness of the world that I've built for in my, in my own imagination. Uh, and that is one where I survive a little bit better than the world that is actually palpable and present. Yeah. And here you read from that Aretha Franklin essay, you really feel it when you see it unfold, unfolding, right? Like when we were yeah. watching that, right? We knew it was something for us and about us. We all knew it was gonna be long, like you said, you know, and yet like it even like went beyond our wildest imaginations of how long it was going to be. And I just remember, you know, like you're describing kind of like checking in on it and watching it for like a couple hours and then yeah. going offline and like watching Twitter, you know, and that eulogy, which was a whole other thing. And it was just like a whole impromptu, like cultural critique kind of happening on Twitter as these things were unfolding and yet felt so true to us in, in a very special way. So I love that essay so much. I, I watched the Aretha funeral in two different cities. I woke up that morning. I had to fly. I was, I was, it was a day of the Decatur Book Festival that year. The Decatur Book Festival was starting that night. And I had to fly to Atlanta from Columbus. And I remember waking up and, you know, I think it started at noon or so, or maybe a little earlier, 11 maybe. And I watched the first like hour of it in Columbus and then got to the airport. And I remember getting off the plane in Atlanta and looking up at the TVs and thinking, huh, it's still going on. Like that feels normal, maybe. It's been like four hours or so. That feels appropriate. And then I remember like really the drive from the Atlanta airport to Decatur is like an hour. And I remember like checking into the hotel and being like, this shit is still like, not only not over, it's like, popping like we're maybe in the, the not even at the crescendo yet you know um, I, think I remember they had the itinerary and it's yeah. like looking down at the bottom because you think it's toward the end and it's still like a third of the way up on the page everyone went over time like everyone I feel like and that was beautiful to me because I mean and I've been to some home going you know as, as I write the book I was raised Muslim and there's such a process to mourning there you know, I remember my mother's funeral was so rigid and the, the language around grief was such a process. And I remember the first funeral I went to that was like in the South, in a church, multiple hours long. I was like, this is wild. People are dancing and people like, we're talking like on top of the casket dancing. I was like, um, there's this thing that I can't even describe because it's shock, but it's pleasure too. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, this is actually something else. This is like, uh, this is another way to grieve. You know, like I can, I can access this. That is, I think about Aretha's funeral all the time. It's like, wow, because there were so many people expressing so many things. Um, gosh, I'm thinking now, Miss Tyson, Miss Cicely Tyson, who, you know, when she passed, I thought back to her moment at Aretha's funeral, and I thought about how joyful it must be to live a life that long, but also also how steeped in grief it must be to outlive everyone you love. Because oh. I mean, Miss Tyson lived like yeah. good long life and lost a lot of people in that process, you know what I mean? And for me, there's like no way to adequately send someone like that home, you know? Right. Um, there's no good way to, to kind of adequately, yeah, I don't know, I'm rambling about females now. <laughs> Well, I just want to take a quick uh, moment to remind the viewers, uh, you can put your questions for Hanif in the chat. Uh, we will be asking them toward the end of the program. You write a lot as well about your family in this book. Um, 
And those ended up being some of the moments that touched me the most, the images that really lingered with me. In the Afrofuturism essay, there's an image of your mother, her Afro like the moon, which I just thought was beautiful. And there's a line I want to read that you write about your father um, in the, I'm going to call it the Whitney Houston essay, but it is so much, it is about Whitney, it is about crossing over, it is about code switching. Um, my father, who would return home after work and sit in our driveway with the windows up on our old van, letting loud jazz fill the car's interior for a few moments before exiting, like it was a bridge bringing him back to a more familiar self. Did you know from the beginning that you would be weaving in the personal like this? And what was it like for you to sort of approach each essay with that aspect? Um, I guess I did. I, I wish I had a better, I'm so bad with explaining process. I think the reality is I don't trust, I don't trust myself as a narrator. I don't trust myself as someone who can effectively deliver information if I'm not constantly checking in and saying, well, I'm still here, I'm here too. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a way that the insertion of the personal, even though I think a lot of this work in the book delves into the spectacular, I sometimes think, take Ellen Armstrong, for example, right? Like at the end of that Magical Negro piece, I insert Ellen Armstrong, who I find, I mean, I just grew such a deep affection for, for Ellen Armstrong in the working on this book. And I know she only appears once in the end of that essay, but I felt like I could drive home something by saying, Ellen Armstrong was performing miracles, but like, so was your mother wow. or parent when your cupboard was bare and then a meal appeared. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Ellen Armstrong, was, Ellen Armstrong was performing miracles for her people, but your kinfolk could perform miracles for you too. You know? Right to drive it home on that level, yeah. And so I think of myself as someone who has no problem kind of knocking at the door of a narrative just to remind people I'm still here. And I think through that reminder to say that not only I'm still here, but we are actually still here. And there is something, I mean, for to talk about bridges, there's something bringing us back towards these stories that's actually not that far from our own lives. Mm. Like we are not, as a people, we are not, the miracles are not inaccessible to us. To say miracle, I think, is to suggest that something is potentially unattainable. But I believe in the touchability of miracles, even if I need to change the scale of what I'm defining a miracle as. But Beautiful. in a way, I think placing myself back into a narrative is to say, I lived this, I saw it, you maybe saw something like it. Mm -hmm. And aren't we a little bit closer to something magical together then? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about Ellen Armstrong because I had yeah. never heard of her before I read this book. And yeah. I learned so much about this book, not only about Ellen, who I'd love for you to talk about a little bit um, for those who have not yet read the book and are curious. Um, but about like moments of people that I do know, um, the beef between James Brown and Joe Tex, like I did not know about that. I did not know about Ben Vereen doing the yeah. black at the white Republican event. Yeah. But, um, so I'm so curious about research and what you were aware of and what you stumbled on, but let's start by talking about Ellen Armstrong and who she was and how you learned yeah. about her. Um, well, yeah. So I'm sure people remember, I'm sure the opportunity of black men probably remember this for sure. But when the phrase black girl magic started to get commodified, there was this kind of run of essays from black women about the dangers of commodification of that term, which to be fair, I mean, not that I doubted them at the time, I was very involved at the time, but I feel like a lot of that has come true. A lot of those, like a lot of the, I remember when, you know, the way that I was seeing white people talk about Stacey Abrams, uh, I was like, all those essays from like four years ago, three years ago, are coming true like right before our eyes. And like they were predicted and people still just couldn't, you know what I mean? People were like, if you start calling, talking about, if, if black girl magic gets commodified, we're gonna start talking about black women like literal superheroes. And what happened? People were like, let's give Stacey Abrams a cape. You know what I mean? <laughs> Literally. Um, but when those essays hit, I was like, I feel this and I am on board with this. But then the like, the nagging research part of my brain was like, but you know what? 
I wonder who the first black woman to do magic in America was. Yeah. And yeah. I fell down this rabbit hole and I found out about John Hartford Armstrong and then his, his daughter, Ellen Armstrong, who took over his show in the early 1900s after he passed. Um, and she performed, you know, her history is so undertold, particularly on the internet, in part because she performed pretty much only for poor black folks in barns and churches. And I have to shout out, there are magic historians, which I did not know was the case until I started working on this book. And I was cold calling them. I would just call, I would like Google magic historians and call them. And there were these chain of magic stories. I called one in Syracuse and I'd be like, tell me, I need everything, I need to know everything I know about Ellen Armstrong. He'd be like, well, I don't really know much, but my friend over in Dallas maybe knows me. I call that friend and they'd be like, I don't know anything. My friend in Seattle knows. So it was this chain of magic historians. And I just, I need everything on Ellen Armstrong. I need it. I need it. I need it. Um, and that's how I kind of found out about, you know, I was so fascinated by her pulling out, pulling coins from behind mm. poor Black people's ears because there's something there. It's no longer just a trick. Not in that era, not for those people, you know. It is the, and it's not even just a providing of a miracle. It's saying you are holding worth. Yeah. You know, you are walking around carrying actual physical worth that you don't know you have because the world doesn't allow you to access it. And there's something miraculous about that. I really love Ellen Armstrong. And so much of the book was like that. I knew things and then I didn't know them well enough. I mean, the James, the James Ryan Joe Tech shit is wild. Motherfucker shot up a club. Crazy. They bought guns to the club. Like, and, but I also, I, I inserted that as a type of, so much of this book, I think, was a correction of the record, too, right? Because whenever I see this moral panic about, like, rappers, you know, in the 90s, early 2000s, rappers shooting up clubs, it was like, yo, James Brown shot up a club, <laughs> like, for real shot up a club, had Otis Redding hiding under a piano shooting up a club, you know what I mean? Um, I don't want to make light of that, but I, I do think, you know, I knew what, I, I knew the story, but didn't know the why. Like I knew James Brown bought a gun to the club and shot up and shot up with Joe Tex, but I was like, I don't really know the why, and I got to find out the why. Yeah. I knew that Ben Vereen. All I knew was that Ben Vereen performed in blackface at the Reagan inauguration, but I didn't know the why. I didn't know um, that the video cut off halfway through. That was the thing that um, really fascinated me. That I also. Well, I didn't know the performance had happened at all, but then to hear that the intent of the performance was sort of cut short, you know, even though, was it ABC had agreed to yeah. play the whole thing? And so all the, the meaning of it, his intention was completely <laughs> lost. I was floored by that. And I cannot imagine how that must have gone down. I can't imagine how he must have felt. I mean, it's, there's a lesson there. Right? To perform for people who don't have enough conscience to realize that they are the joke and not part of the joke. Mm -hmm. it puts you in a really treacherous spot. And, it, uh, and I think Ben Green learned that perhaps, or maybe he didn't. But it goes back to, I tied that. I tied that to, to Burt Williams, or he tied it to Burt Williams, who ironically, you know, one thing I found while researching this book, and it pops up in the book three or four times, there were in the vaudeville era, there would be Black performers like Burt Williams, like Black Herman, who would die on stage or get close to death. In Burt Williams' case, he like passed out on stage and then died like a day later because it was intended to. But Black performers would die on stage and white audiences would think it was part of the performance. Oh, wow. Right? They would just think, they would just sit there while this person was dead on stage and like a cheer or laugh. And it creates this kind of treacherous notion of to talk about the recognition of one's humanity is a vague thing, but the perils of not doing that can be very tangibly pressed against the glass when you're talking about performers dying on stage and people in an audience imagining that it is for their pleasure mm. because they can't imagine anything else, you know? Wow. Yeah. Um, when I was um, tweeting about this event and getting very excited about it and telling people to come through, you know, um, the Whitney Houston essay on several different levels blew my mind. Um, and we talked about this a little bit in the green room. I had never seen any of those performances, I hadn't seen the Grammy performance, 
hadn't known, well, I knew about the Soul Train Awards. She met Bobby at one of the Soul Train Awards, right? Yeah, yeah, the, um, yeah. But sort of her history at the Soul Train Awards of being embraced some years, booed one or maybe two years, Twice. two years, and then giving that um, acceptance award, the Sammy Davis Jr. Um, award. And I actually, I went to Google so many times I went to Google to look up these performances. Did you watch? Did you watch the Sammy Davis Jr. award speech? I did. You see that look she gave the audience? Yes. That was a look, boy. <laughs> yeah, it I was, was a proud. Look. And the woman, I was so proud. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm really interested in that essay because I am interested in the images of Black women and the performance of Black women and how a Black woman celebrity sort of like performs in tune or out of tune with that image. And I thought mm -hmm. the essay kind of gets at that um, very well. I just kind of want to talk about, um, and, and there's another part of the essay where you talk about um, being Black and into alternative music, which, you know, is sort of the genesis of my book. So you grew up in Columbus, Black schools, Black neighborhoods, all of that. And what I really, really loved about this essay is a realization that I probably did not have until I went to an HBCU because I went to white schools and I did not grow up in, in a Black neighborhood. But it's like, you're not all that special for liking this music. Like everybody, somebody rocked this music, you know? When you talk about like somebody was blasting Radiohead Creep or like Nevermind was huge. And I remember being at FAMU and like the party went up for Smells Like Teen Spirit, the party went up for Nine Inch Nails, you know? And that was probably the biggest revelation of my life. <laughs> and the happiest revelation of my life because I had spent so many years like feeling almost like a little bit of shame for being into these forms of music, being into punk or alternative or all of those things. So um, can you talk about, I, I don't even know if I can articulate a question around this, but can you just talk about this essay a little bit? It's called On the Certain and Uncertain Movement of Limbs and how you were able to kind of tie all those pieces together in it. Yeah, a really wild fact is that the Whitney Houston essay and the Soul Train essay were once the same essay. Oh. In the, in the first draft of the book, they were the same thing. They're like, it was like 9,000 words in um, Maya Millet. Br truly the best editor I ever worked was like, these two deserve, Don Cornelius and Whitney Houston deserve their own space. And at the time I was mulling um, this frustration I felt about how historically, I mean, not just in music and popular culture and performance, but black women are often treated only as tragic figures. Like I think it, this goes back to like the blues, I think. Um, but it's happened with Josephine Baker and with Whitney and so on and so on. And so I, I agree, I was kind of like, yeah, Whitney needs her own space and how can I provide that? Um, but also I was interested in this argument around what is and isn't black enough and how Whitney Houston's marketing was not so often it feels like a failure of some executive somewhere their imaginations of what they think black people are. Some, some executives, and not just white ones either, right? Like we see this with black record executives too. Because with Whitney, it was like, well, she's gotta be pop, so we have to market her this way. It's like, well, fucking black people love pop music. Love. Especially by that point, you know what I mean? Like in the eighties, are you kidding me? You know what I mean? Like she didn't have to be anything other than what she was, but in their imagination, in the crafting of her into what they thought she had to be, black people peeped that. You know? And so I, I did want to kind of weigh all these things and strip away the feeling of specialness for liking or abstaining from something. I mean, I grew up in a neighborhood and a place, some of this is timing. I grew up on the youngest of four, I had older siblings, which is a real blessing for a music fan, I think. And I have older siblings who, and I grew up in a golden era, I think, the golden era of college radio in a, in a college town. Yeah, That's a big helps. one. Yeah, that all helps, yeah. Um, I mean, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio in the 90s, and college radio DJs were just playing whatever they wanted. So yeah. you would get, like, Blind Melon next to Erica Badu, next to Common, next to Radiohead. It was just kind of next to Fiona Apple. You know what I mean? There was just no discernment 
And I was so fascinated by the rise of college radio because it was, and these DJs were black. The people, the people who slid me my first punk tapes were black. And so I never had this idea around like, this is what black people listen to, or it, this person's special because they listen to a Weezer song. And it was never that ecosystem where I was getting made fun of for what I was listening to because everyone I was around was at least a semi-curious listener. Yeah, you know? I mean, I, you know, I didn't, I'm an only child, so I didn't have older siblings, but I did have an older cousin, my cousin Mike, who, you know, was very into Native tongues, very into, you know, De La and Tribe and all that. But I also remember him being heavy into Duran Duran when we were younger, oh, yeah. you know, and all of those things. And that expansiveness, that curiosity, and that love of like pop music, like what's playing on the radio and like finding things that are interesting. So yeah, I really, I really appreciated that essay very much. Um, I kind of want to get a little before we go to questions. The book is structured in a really interesting way. It's structured in movements, you call them, and, and each of those movements starts off with very short writings. Um, they are called, I'm trying to find. Oh, on, on times I force myself to dance. Yes, yes. Yeah. Can you talk about those and how you feel you were trying to set up each movement through those essays? Well, it's interesting because those began as just a writing exercise in between drafts of the book. When I was like, I think this book is becoming something different and I need to figure out how to articulate mm -hmm. the, the way it's becoming different. I just took to writing one of these or two of these a day um, for like two weeks. You know, I would just kind of sit down and free write. Yeah. Uh, and they kind of unintentionally, I mean, I think I had 20 of them. Oh, wow. And I think we just pulled some that unintentionally, accidentally fit the movements of the book. Um, you know, and I took a lot of the work to Maya and laid it out. Her whole thing was kind of like, you were writing into themes and not even knowing it, mm. which, you know, I think is that happens, right? I, I feel like sometimes when we sit down and write, like these were all disparate essay or disparate essays that kind of had their own worlds, but their worlds were still in the larger world of my imagination. And so they were linking themselves together, even when I wasn't thinking about them being linked together. And, um, in a way, this kind of silly writing exercise I'd taken on was the glue, yeah. and I just didn't know it. For me, like, those weren't even going to end up in the book. Really and truly, it was just kind of a practice I needed to get into. I was feeling so discouraged after I kind of discarded half the book and knew I had to get back to work on it. Mm. I was just like, I don't think I can do this. I'm not really up for this. Um, I don't have it in me. And... Much like, I mean, this is a practice of mine. In the, in the last poetry book, A Fortune for Disaster, there's like 18 poems that all have the same title. These poems are flowers. And that is the same shit where it was like, I threw away half that book. I was really discouraged. And I needed a writing exercise to get me in a groove. And then that writing exercise became the actual spine of the book. Oh. And so I, I think this is just a trend that I have uh, unfortunately begun to take on. I would like to write a book without throwing away half of it. But uh, I mean, there are so many, um, there could be so many heartbreaks in the process of, of right. the book. I mean, I throwing away half of it, I'm sure that was like a little mourning period, right? And like grieving for that work that you thought belonged in here but maybe didn't belong in here and then thinking about what does belong what was that what was the how long did it take you to write this book I think the earliest piece was done in 2016 and then you know I finished it in 2020 um but really so my process is my process in my last two books have been I work slow on a first draft and then I finish a first draft and then I discard most of the book and then I kind of sprint through a second draft. So that happened with this book too, where like I started the second draft in like maybe mid 2019, which is wild because I turned it in like in four or five months. Um, but I'm a big like sprint to the, once I kind of get my head around, you know what it is? I think I've worked so hard to find out what isn't it. Um, and I need that. I need the, the labor of finding out what isn't it. Right. Because once I find out what is it, 
I'm gone. I'm off and running. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but I need that slow process of finding out what isn't it. You know, I'm an, I'm an athlete. Like I grew up playing sports and I played sports in high school and in college and um, I played soccer. And there's something about that kind of practice that still bleeds into my creative practice where um, I was I was always so meticulous in figuring out what wasn't it for me. But then once I figured it out largely on my own, I was I was gone. How, wait, how long did it take you to write Opal and Nev? I, I was actually curious about this because it, it felt like it was you're because you have this journalistic nature um, to both your writing, but you're also like a literal journalist. Um, yeah. And I feel like I know I'm not supposed to ask you questions, my bad, but um, it, 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 I was interested in how long it took to like build that world. Yeah. Um, it took me about five years to get to the end of a first draft and then probably another year and a half to two revising it. That's wild. It is a lot. It feels like, I mean, it feels like it just, you know, I don't know. I know that this isn't supposed to be talking to me, but I would love to talk to you sometime about like your journalist, your journalist impulses and how like, for me, they seem to inform the fiction yeah. um, in a way that was really delightful. Thank you. Um, well, I like, noticed that yeah. in, in Little Devil as well. I mean, you know, not to go back to the Whitney Houston essay, but the um, the archival material that you weave into that, the People Magazine article, um, which felt so vivid to me, you know, and yeah. so um, so wonderful to have that in there. And we, I think we both stared into archival stuff you know, while we were writing. Um, for me, it was like a lot of videos, lots of YouTube, Dick Cavett late night, you know, interviews and things like that. And, and photography as well, you know, still images that I could kind of riff on and dream into. And I'm curious about like the archival stuff that really kind of sparked for you. Oh gosh. I mean, Soul Train, but also like, you know what's great about Josephine Baker is that there are, like her whole career can be accessed on YouTube. There are performances from like 50 years of performances. There are performances from the 20s and from the, up, up until the 70s. That is so stunning to me. And to watch her, the thing I always say is that I, I truly wish more people would talk about Josephine Baker as an athlete because she did a great many things on stages, but she was athletic for real. Uh, I mean, there's this clip, uh, what is like her first movie? I forget what it is, but there's this clip of her that I absolutely love. I just watched it with Dr. Terry Francis, who wrote a wonderful book about Josephine Baker. Um, we just did a talk together and she was like, I'm gonna keep playing this all day. There's this clip where she like jumps off a high balcony in a film and she not only lands on her feet, but she lands like into a dance. Floor. So she effectively lands on like one foot. Wow. Perfectly balanced. That's just like, a feat of athleticism that is unparalleled. You know what I mean? Like, I think Josephine Baker is like, I can make this argument in another book maybe, but I think Josephine Baker is one of the greatest athletes of her era. She just didn't play a traditional quote unquote sport, although I believe dance to be a sport, but that's another time. Um, <laughs> so a lot of Josephine Baker performances, but also just like a lot of LaBelle, I watched so many LaBelle mm, porns. Yes, that, that was another, yeah, I think connection between our books was the yeah, yeah, yeah. quite a lot. Because I could just watch them all day. The the way that they moved in those spacesuits or the or the feathers, maybe the feathers being more impressive. Um, so a lot of old performances from the 70s, but also just like, you're right. There was something about still photos that allowed me an opportunity to bring a scene to life without just describing. There's something about watching a video where my impulse is to describe every movement of the video. And there's something about my looking at a still photo where my impulse instead is to describe the possibility of the yes, photo, right? Yes. Which feels more generative for me. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I love to describe videos as well and, and paint that picture, but there's something about a still photo that says, well, I don't know what was going on in the world of this photo as much as you don't know what's going on in the world of this photo. So let's imagine together. So we're getting some uh, audience questions. Um, let's see, from, 
Okay, is there a relationship between performance and black performance to say more about? Is there something unique or singular that's indicated by not just performance, but black performance for Hanif? Sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, for me, the way that I define black forms in the book was that it feels very in conversation with my living, uh, my personal living in a way that has its own language. Um, that I, I think many, I mean, clearly everyone can access, but I think the accessing of it can be treacherous depending on who's accessing it. Mm -hmm. I, I think the witnessing of it can definitely be witnessed by everyone, but I think the way that I relate to it, it has like a language unto itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that question, by the way, was from Dins and Staples. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this question is for me as we wait for more to come in. Um, we both know how long the publishing process can be, right? And you've written a book that, like you could continue adding to this book, like oh, yeah. <laughs> forever and ever. And I think like it was probably for me, it was two years between when, you know, my book was acquired to when it was actually out um, on, on in bookstores or whatever. So I'm just curious, like, are you still in this mindset when you when you see something, a performance, you're kind of thinking about it in these terms, these very analytical terms. And like, what would you, if you could do like a second edition, if you could add on to Little Devil? Um, this is a great question that I'm so stressed out about it currently <laughs> because there's an essay I pulled from the book because this wasn't working um, about black facial expressions and how the black facial expression is its own language. And it just wasn't working because I was kind of doing the thing where I'm just like in awe of the, of the phenomenon and not writing anything insightful. And this thing had happened like two months ago. I was watching Inside the NBA or whatever, and Candace Parker was on there, and Shaq was on some bullshit. And the way she looked at him, like she said something. <laughs> I remember like, you tweeted about this, didn't you? Tweeted I tweeted about it because it, it was like, it unlocked everything in that essay for me. And it was right after the book came out. And I was like, ugh. Like, that's it. Why couldn't I have seen that? Like, just another, I needed, and that's it. That's how I think this book is going to live in my brain. There are things I pulled out from the book where I think I just needed to see something. Yeah. Because the Candace Parker thing, I was like, that is it. That's, I know exactly what I want to write about now. She's doing the thing, like, she's articulating it all for me. And I have now, like, a touchstone that I can return to. And so there are, I put my, when you ask that question, I put my hands on my face. So I was like, I'm so stressed out about this right now because, Ever since I let this book go, there have been things, I think about essays I pull, I see things in the world where I'm like, oh, that's the thing I needed to see in order to get that done. But that's the joy too. That's the joy of writing and having a living document and the mercy of still being alive and in the, and still kind of steeped in the ecosystem of this book because the things I'm seeing are informing and propelling me towards really joyful insights that I don't even need to end up in the book, right? Yeah. It was enough for me to, to tweet about that and be like, yo, look at Candace Parker's face and have black people be like, she's saying, I know exactly what she's saying. I know the exact tone she's saying it in. She's got a paragraph, you know what I mean? She's got like a paragraph in that look. That was fulfilling enough for me in the moment. So on that note, I mean, do you think you will, uh... Will you follow that up? Will you will you include it in something in the future? What's next for me? Um, I'm working on a book right now. Well, to say I'm working on it, I'm taking some time off and then working on a book about basketball movies. I was going to say, I, yeah, I wondered if you were going to do something sports. I, I, honestly, the sports book was what I always wanted. It's funny because I, I've wanted all these other books too, but there's this concept of music that I know you know, Donnie, where like, you know, you make the albums that other people want and then you finally get to make your, you know, your, yeah. you know, your whole thing, the, the Terrence Trent Darby kind of arc or whatever. Um, and I, the sports, I wanted to write a sports book more than anything else. Um, and I loved writing these books a lot, but I felt like I kind of earned my way into writing a thing about sports. So I'm working on a thing about basketball movies and LeBron James. And that seems like it'll be fun. Amazing. Well, I will let you have that last word in with that. Um, thank you so much, Hanif. This has been like the best part of my day to talk to you. I love this book so much. And no, are you kidding me? I love your book so much. And I loved, I don't know, I want to talk about Stop Making Sense so much. We got to find time. Somebody that let us get on their little Zoom, whatever, and talk about Stop yeah, Making Sense. I love that. Talk about, uh, yeah. talk about music a bit more. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much. And I think we're bringing Novella back. Oh, 
you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Clearly, we are at the end of the day, but I wanted to say you all are that Black abundance that KSA Layman talks about in his book. I so appreciated this conversation. Um, thank you, Hanif and Donnie, for being beautiful souls, for your beautiful writing. If you are looking for summer reads, I highly recommend The Final Revival of Opal and Nev and A Little Devil in America. Uh, I totally forgot about the whole spades game thing. Like there was a whole involved post that I had planned on posting on IG about spades. So I appreciated that essay, Hanif. So thank you. We are at the end of the Schomburg's third annual uh, Schomburg Center Literary Festival. I appreciate every single one of you who hung out with us for the day. I hope that you've been enjoying your June tea. Hopefully there is some good food somewhere involved. Hopefully there is some Black performance involved as well. And if not, hopefully there's just some rest. This year's literary festival, I believe, honored the talent of some of our greatest contemporary writers. Uh, and it did build on the foundation created by Arturo Schomburg. Uh, hopefully you felt encouraged uh, in your freedom of thought, the relentless pursuit of Black history, and the engagement of our imagination towards our collective freedom. There are so many thank yous that need to be said, but I want to say these ones out loud uh, because these are folks who have been with us every step of the way and are made sure that this festival felt special um, as the world begins to transition to being in person. Thank you, Khalila Bates, who is our associate producer. She's basically the other side of the public programming team here. So you see me, but you might as well see her just as many times. We're moderating, moderating the chats, getting all of our guests together, fill in the blank. She's doing all of those things. So I can't thank her enough, um, but know that you are well appreciated, Khalila. And to the entire Park Boulevard team, you all continue to be with us. You are with us in our Langston Hughes Auditorium, and now you are with us virtually on the Langston Hughes as well as the Nella Larson stage, uh, led by Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Serena Rockauer, who is the production manager, audiovisual at the New York Public Library. Uh, she helps troubleshoot all of our questions uh, since we've been in this virtual space and another face that you never see, uh, but we could not do this work without her. Virginia Mixon, who is the Schomburg Shop Coordinator. Uh, she is the person who makes sure that all of the books are being stocked. She is the one who is sending them out. She's the one who's making sure your transactions are processed. So I hope you are supporting our authors by buying their books, but also thank our Schomburg uh, shop coordinator for continuing to do this work while we've been in quarantine. Um, and now as we open up, thank you, Katia, to Tubman, who's manager of education programs. Thank you, Joy Bivens, who is our incoming Schomburg director, uh, who also moderated a conversation. Uh, today and has been an interim director, uh, co-interim director as well, and has been really helpful and uh, supportive throughout the planning of this festival to Rayo and Honey for these wonderful pennants um, that says uh, words like freedom. That is the theme for this year. And I'm sure that there are many others, but my list uh, is my little squirrely thing is not working uh, at the moment. So I can't get to the bottom of my page, but I so appreciate every single author, every single moderator who said yes uh, to participating and giving up some of your time this Saturday. Have an amazing evening. Uh, have a little barbecue for me, wherever you might be. Uh, and we'll see you again at the Schomburg Center, hopefully next time in person. Have a good one.